Thank you very much. Uh, I am very moved to be here because uh, uh, very rarely at a conference do I meet uh, such a fantastic set of, of, of friends and, uh, and people whose papers I read and I, I was educated on and I was, I was influenced by. And, you know, it's like, a, like a, uh, an encyclopedia of of the modern technology that I was involved in. So I'm very, very moved. Bon anniversaire. And uh, I, wa I have to tell a story. You know, everybody tells a story about Stefan. So I have to tell my story about Stefan. I was a young uh, a professor once at the Technion, and I was sitting in my office. And uh, a gentleman comes into my office and says, maybe you know my son. And I say, you know, I have to know who your son is. And then he says, uh, Stefan Mala. And I said, oh, of course, I know, uh, very famous uh, wavelets and this and that. And he says, I am his father and I am on the board of governors of the Technion. So this is how I found out about the uh, strong connection of the Mala family um, with the Technion. Uh, and, and then you, of course, uh, research a little bit more and find out that uh, Stefan's grandfather in Istanbul, in Constantinople, he, he actually uh, made sure that, that there was a, an approval for building the Technion in 1912, something like this. You know, 1912, is Israel didn't exist. Uh, and uh, the, the, co the, the community was planning a, a technical school, a technical university, and the Ottoman Empire was not really ready to approve it, so they had to go and, uh, and get the, secure the, the approval. And then, so this is Stefan's grandfather, and his father became a member of the board of the governors of the Technion, and then we met Stefan when we we, uh, we, we, he honored us in accepting an honorary doctorate from the Technion. And uh, this was wonderful to, to find out. And ever since then, ever since uh, the time that I realized that there are so st such strong connections, we were in touch, yes? <laughs> so we are friends for a long, long time. I think that must have been 91, 90, something like this. And, um, so we are going along, uh, we are going back a long time and, uh, and uh, the reason I put these two wings here is, uh, is a little secret. Do you know why? What is the meaning of the name Mala? It's angel. Okay? So there is a meaning that maybe some of you, you didn't know, so Stefan is an angel. <laughs> okay, so let me see if it goes. So I wanted to, uh, when, I, when I was invited to this, thing, to this uh, event, I said, sure, I will come, and I'm very, very grateful that I was invited. And, uh, and I, I, I started to think about what should I talk about, and I decided that I'm going to talk about something that is anti- uh, uh, hierarchical, as anti-hierarchical as possible uh, in order to go in the opposite direction. You know, every, everybody's talking about hierarchies of representations in which you have first the most important thing and then you get details and you get details and you get details and this is, this is what multi-resolution is all about and it's a wonderful concept and it's very useful and everybody uses it, but I encountered a uh, problem in which, which led me to this path, and I'm going to tell you the story of this, of this, uh, this anti-hierarchical story, which is holographic data representation. So I'm at the Technion, I am also affiliated with NTU in Singapore. So what is a hologram? A hologram is a recording, is a Lippmann Lippmann thing, Lippmann style thing done by Denise Gabor 
It's a recording of a three-dimensional scene by an optical sensing device, and it actually it actually uses the wave nature of the of the light, and uh, of course uh, a hologram of a scene is something amazing. You know, you have uh, you can buy holograms uh, for fun, and uh, these are like uh, little plates that you look at them, and suddenly a three-dimensional thing pops up at you, and you can see it, and you can turn it around, and you can see some amazing things. And this is very, very, very beautiful. But one of the, one of the most interesting things about a hologram that was for me always very amazing is the knowledge that if you cut this hologram into little pieces, okay, and you look at the pieces of the hologram, what you see is not a piece of the scene that has been, that has been <laughs> recorded, but you see the whole, the whole thing again. You see it a little bit more blurred. You see it a little bit with uh, with some uh, with some uh, something that is uh, that is not uh, that is not uh, as clear. But you record the entire scene, and the quality of the recording is dependent on how big the the portion of the hologram that you are looking at. Okay, so this is something very 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 beautiful. So the question is. The question is, how do, you, how do you emulate such a thing? Okay, so how, 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 would, how could we encode uh, an image or data or things like this in a holographic way? So this is the question. And we, uh, the, 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 the straightforward answer is learn what Gabor has proposed and reproduce it, you know, digitally. Today we have fantastic computers. You can actually do digitally the recording of this thing, thing and, and do, do almost everything that, that the physics. But the question is, can you do other things? And the hist my history of, uh, uh, the history of holography is known. Uh, Denis Gabor, uh, uh, quite a ge genius, uh, got a Nobel Prize for it in 1971. Then uh, there it found lots of applications. But my uh, work started at Bell Labs at around 1994 with a challenge that was about watermarking of images. You know, watermarking data is an important thing. You know, you want to uh, make sure that uh, you, take a, you, you take a beautiful image, you put it on the internet. The, m the moment you put it on the internet, everybody can use it. You want to have some sort of a signature that makes sure that everybody knows that this is a picture that was made by me and I want credit for it and I want to be paid for it sometimes, I, all kinds of things like this. So watermarking became an issue at some point and, um, and, and people were uh, starting to talk about watermarking text by moving a little bit the letters around in imperceptible ways and all kinds of things like this. And then a guy called Lario Gorman told me, you know, people are working on watermarking. Uh, how would you do watermarking of images? So we, I started to think about it. And, and, uh, and watermarking is this process, this, this requirement of embedding a low uh, rate piece of information. Like this, is, this image was taken by, uh, by me at this and this date and things like this. These are a few bits. And, and you want to, uh, to this, this data to appear in, a, in an image. But, but, but there is an interesting requirement that you know somebody can take my image and can take only a part of it and use it for something. And you want that part to also contain the information and not only the co uh, contain the information that this image was taken by pop and stop, okay? You want this whole thing to have, the whole text should appear there also. So in every portion of this image, sort of holographically, the, the signature should, should appear, okay? So we need a holographic watermark. So then um, the idea, and I worked together with uh, Tom Richardson, who then became very famous for 
his work on, on, on coding and all kinds of things at Qualcomm. But uh, he was at uh, Bell Labs, uh, a fantastic place at the time, where also I met uh, my previous, the previous speaker who was giving talks on, on neural networks uh, as a solution for the, for the digit recognition problem at the time. And, uh, and a holographic, uh, uh, and, we, and we wrote a, we wrote a, a, a paper called the holographic transform domain image watermarking method. And the idea was very, very simple. You take the image, you take its Fourier transform, and you take the, the various components of the various co coefficients of the Fourier transform, and you modify them. You take a mask, a, a, a very faint mask with which you multiply the, the, the Fourier transform of this image, and then you get some of the some of the uh, some of the coefficients are diminished some of them are uh, enhanced a little bit and and then you retransform okay and when you retransform hopefully you didn't change much yeah you you the 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 image is still good it's still perceptible it, it still looks exactly like you like you had it before but now it contains this a pattern in it, which is like a logo, uh, your name, your thing, and uh, and uh, and uh, it's detectable if you have the original and uh, and uh, and the uh, and the watermarked po portion of it, and the Fourier has this wonderful property. Fourier is holographic. Fourier is is all over the place, and this is what uh, Stefan fought against. <laughs> okay. This is what Stefan's work is fighting against. It's, 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 a, it's an anti-holographic thing, yeah? You want, you want localization, you want, uh, you, want, you want another property. So here it is, a problem in which you have to go to the other, to the other direction, yeah? Okay, so um, uh, the, the, uh, the water, uh, now no, this watermarking thing, was uh, a very nice, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed uh, writing this paper. We, we, we even made a patent on it, you know, being at Bell Labs, you make patents and all kinds of things like this. And then, and then what's happening is that uh, I started thinking about it. This is a wonderful idea. You are, you are taking the, uh, the, the pattern with which you, with which you, uh, uh, watermarked the image. That is an image itself, okay? That was for us an image itself. And that was holographically encoded by using the image, okay? So now you have the image that, that was the, 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 the carrier of, a, of another image that was holographically encoded by this thing. So the question is, can you now go from this idea of holographic watermarking to do holographic image representations. So, so you have like, instead of having a, a, a representation of an image that is hierarchical, that is this, can you do this? And what, what could be a good, uh, what could be a good, uh, 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 a good application for this? Well, we are in an era when, where, where things are being spread out distributed over the internet, you might, you might want to have this representation in such a way that when you are getting packets of the representation and you want progressive refinement, you will get progressive refinement but order in an orderless manner. You know, you don't want the most important packet to, to be received first and then you get uh, some, some, some low resolution representation of the image, then you get another packet, you get a, a better representation and so forth, so you, 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 you go in this other direction. So, uh, we want, you, want, you, want this, you want this other, other domain, okay? So that's, that's what we, I started to think about. And in fact, uh, here is a comparison. When you have a 
hierarchical multi-resolution representation, you get the first por portion, and then you get refinements, you get improvements. Now the question is, can you do it with orderless things? So you get any, uh, for any of the first packets, and you get a low resolution <laughs> representation. You get another packet, you get some improvement. And then you get the third one and you get some improvement and so forth. Can you do this? Is this possible at all? What is the price that you pay for it and things like that? So these are very interesting questions. So I've been working at this problem on and off ever since, okay? Because it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful question and that's an interesting question and and you know, it's always very nice from time to time to go against the grain, okay? You know, everybody's going this way, you should go uh, that way, okay? So, um, okay, so uh, we, wrote, uh, we, we wrote some papers about this with, uh, together with uh, Arune Travalli and uh, Bob Holt at Bell Labs. <laughs> I was working there. And we wrote a paper in 98 <coughs> called Holographic Representations of Images. Then we, uh, we, we did something about transform compressions and low frequency, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they are, but very, uh, very briefly, I don't want to, uh, to spend time on, on details because they are in the papers and you can, you can find them. But I hope, uh, I hope this will uh, convince you that maybe uh, this area should be done. So. Um, uh, the the uh, representations that we proposed are the following. Uh, use the image as a two, which is a 2D array of positive numbers. Okay, the, an image is an array of 2D, 2, 2D positive numbers. Um, use it uh, as the magnitude of some complex image, and the complex phase that you add at every location is a random phase. Okay, so you take a randomized phase mask and you add a randomized phase to every, uh, to every uh, pixel. And now you take this complex image and take its Fourier transform. What does it achieve? It achieves something that is very, very cute. You know, if you take an image and take its Fourier transform, you are going to get the low frequencies, which are the important coefficients, and then you get some other coefficients which are more important, uh, less important, and less important, and you get the, the details in the, in the higher and higher frequencies. But this uh, randomized mask is spreading the, 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 the butter all over the place, okay? So you, you, don't get, you don't get a DC, you get some uh, you, get, you get some information everywhere, but it's holographically spread in the, in the image. So now, what you have to do is, uh, just a second, what you have to do is in order to recover the, the, the content from a portion of this, uh, of this transform, you take it and you, you, you do the Fourier transform, you do the Fourier transform of that portion, and you take the magnitude. Okay, so it's almost like impossible to believe, yeah? You take an image, you add to it random phase, you, uh, you, get a, you get a 1024 by 1024 image, then you take any portion, any portion from this 1024, which is 256 by 256, you take it, uh, you take its, uh, its Fourier transform, you take only the amplitude, and you are getting back the original image a little bit uh, uh, blurred, okay? Uh, a lot blurred, actually, at some point, yeah? <laughs> but, 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 but you get the image, you get the image, you get, you get everything, you get, you get a, a, a little piece of, of everything, so this is a... a I, I found it a very cute idea, and actually we did experiments, and it was amazing. Yeah, you could, you could do it, so it's in the paper. And then we said, oh, but could you do it uh, some other way? Well, uh, the, the natural way to do it is to use sampling. You can sample an image, and if you sample an image and the samples are not taken, you know, they are, you, are not, you are not reading this image 
by uh, rows or by any uh, nice uh, ordered ordered manner, but you are you are uh, you are trying to simply pseudo randomly spread over the entire thing. So any portion of this will give you samples of the image, and then maybe you can do e interpolation, and maybe you can get a a subsampled image which is still reasonable. So then uh, the question was, uh, you, you were led to, a, to an interesting question of generating these sampling schemes in which, which ensure, for example, that if you, if you, if you had a, a million samples and you take any portion of uh, 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 256 times 256 uh, strings, you are going to get uh, one sample at least in every uh, four by four or in every eight by eight uh, uh, corner of this. So this led us to a lot of designs and things like this. And, and, and it's not true that these are ob ab absolutely new or different or things like this, but they were not used for these purposes. So we actually used them and, and we, uh, we had this. And now we also have... Um, um, uh, 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 a, a third, we also had a third idea in which we, uh, uh, we realized that this problem, of course, was uh, discussed in information theory as multiple representations. And, and I'll, I'll tell about uh, uh, some, some, some uh, other, other approaches. But um, what is happening is that you could use jittered quantizers in the JPEG, for example. You could take J the JPEG, the classical JPEG is based on, on, on doing local transforms and then doing quantization. And then what happens is that when you, when you do JPEG, you, you, um, you do some uh, data reduction. You, you, sort of, you sort of compress. And you can have compressed packages which have a quality factor. You remember the quality factor. So the question is now, if you have a quality factor and you compress twice with the same quality factor, you get, you don't get, uh, you don't, from two portions, you don't get a better result. But if you have two uh, compressed images with, quality, with a low quality factor, but the quantizers were jittered, you could get much better because it's, it's effectively a, a quantizer with more with more bits per pixel. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea, and we explored that also, and we wrote a paper on about jitter quantizer. So these were the three papers that I read. And then, recently, um, I went to, when I started going to NTU, I started uh, working there with various groups of people, and together with uh, 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 this group of people, we, and, and with my student, Yoda Dar, who was uh, who was a postdoc at uh, at uh, at at <laughs> with Rich with Rich for a while yes uh, we did we did we we returned and revisited this problem so I'm going to revisit this problem while I am alive I guess because it's such a such a cute problem so so uh, we we revisited this problem in the following in the following setting you have a a random vector which has a uh, auto covariance it's a classical thing i'm not throwing away uh, probability theory yeah? <laughs> so 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 you you have a random vector and 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 you have a probability distribution and 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 you ask yourself whether you can sense this random vector you can send it through some through several channels so that when you are getting one, one portion of it, you get a, a reasonable estimate of this vector. But when you get any two, you get a better thing. So, so, so it's, a, it's a problem in estimation theory in, in sort of a modified uh, classical Wiener filtering uh, kind of uh, thing. You know, people don't know yet, uh, any, 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 any Wiener filtering anymore. It's, uh, it has been thrown away, yes, but, uh, but it still exists. Uh, so we, we, we did some work on this, uh, uh, date distribu uh, in distributed data acquisition, and uh, with Yehuda Dar was also doing some very nice work with us, with Miki and myself, about, about uh, compression, about, uh, about, yeah, yeah, I'm going to finish, with compression and, and, 
And then he said, he came up with the, the, this idea that you take an image and you can jitter a little bit an image. You move it a little bit and you do the same compression. You jitter it, you do the same compression. So now you have like five or six or ten portions of the, the ten uh, representations of this image which were compressed, jittered versions. And then you decompress, you inverse, invert the jitter, which is a very small portion of information that you need, and then you average again and you, you get better and better. So, so there are various ideas and I encourage you to think about it and come up with even better ideas than all of these. Um, uh, okay, so what was interesting is that when we were doing this, uh, so we wrote these papers that appeared recently, and uh, we are, uh, uh, we are, uh, Okay, so the holographic sensing process is that you have packets. You, this is the, the description of the of the process of sensing, and and it's ac actually a problem of uh, uh, of of multi. Uh, uh, this is a shift-based compression that I told you. So uh, holographic uh, sensing continues to raise interesting mathematical and technological challenges, in my opinion. It is connected uh, in information theory with multiple description coding. And then you go to the literature and you ask yourself who did work on this, and you find papers by uh, Martin and his colleagues. <laughs> so uh, here the, 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 the circle is closed. So multiple description information theory is is the right framework for these things, but but uh, what uh, what 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 I told you is uh, like practical approximations to what multiple description information theory would give you, and actually there are not too many results on this. Actually, there are a few results by Vivek Goyal and uh, Yelena, and they used frame frame uh, theories and all kinds of things like this that could be used, but I think it's still a very exciting idea and it's a very exciting uh, topic yeah holographic holographic representation so so uh, bon anniversaire uh, stefan I, i'm i'm really i'm really happy to be here and to 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 talk to you about this and uh, to talk to you in general about anything yes maybe there's another connection to me it's simple, like a simple connection is with compressed sensing itself which is that by giving you random projection, and if the decoder is find the object in this L1 ball or yeah, okay. set, it doesn't matter <laughs> which order I wish you yeah. projection. And so you have by definition. Definition, okay. So here it is, we have a solution. Because, because you you just like, if you're looking at the intersection between the space of images and the, and the random substance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Yeah. So it's holographic. It's holographic by, by definition. Very good. Okay. So here it is. But but I think I think it's it's very nice to think about it in this way. You know, like even the so compressed sensing maybe maybe compressed yeah, sensing is solving is solving the multi uh, multiple the but you know do you have like rates and the rate distortions yeah. and things like this? Okay, so that's very good. But I don't know. I mean, it depends how much you believe yeah. in stuff, of course. You know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. There's a degree of belief that you believe it. Okay. <laughs> so, some more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.